start a series today that is called a cry for revival. The United States of America has a deep history in the revival movement going all the way back to the years before the country was actually founded up until recent years but and I'm going to make a negative statement here so and that's not I know that's not the way you're supposed to start any kind of presentation but I've got to make one I got to make a negative statement here the church landscape in America in 2019 has turned into a desert wasteland there has never been a time in our nation's history where we needed revival more than we need it right now. Uh, I found some, a, a compilation that was put together by Patrick Morley. Now, you Promise Keepers guys will remember him. You remember the book, The Man in the Mirror? Patrick Morley was the author. So he's the one who actually put all of this information together. Um, well... I'm getting ahead of myself. I got a great title for this sermon. <laughs> Dry as a bone. <laughs> now that wasn't supposed to be funny, but okay. But what I want to share with you is I want to go back. I want to give you a history lesson this morning. And I want to take you through the revival movement that has swept through this country from its inception up until recent years. So we start with the Great Awakening of 1734 to 1743. This broke out in the, in the area around New Hampton, Massachusetts, under the leadership and the preaching of a young man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Edwards had preached for months and had seen no fruit for out of his labor. But then on a particular Sunday, he reported that six people were converted. One in particular, a young woman who was known for being a great company keeper in the town. Now you can read into that what you want to. And he was afraid that her conversion was going to kind of throw water on everything. But actually the very opposite took place. Following that Sunday, 300 souls were converted in the next six months in a town of only 1,100 people. And the news spread like wildfire, and several revivals began to break out in, in surrounding towns. Uh, then down uh, in Philadelphia, a revival broke out under the preaching of this man, George Whitfield. Now, he was a dramatic preacher. He was very short in stature, but he had a voice that they said could be heard by crowds of 20,000 and above. And an estimated 80% of the American population of 900,000 colonists heard Whitfield preach. And he became at one time known as the best, as the most recognized figure in this young country. In 1800, there was the second Great Awakening. By 1800, only 1 in 15 of America's population of 5,300,000 actually belonged to an evangelical church. And a Presbyterian minister, minister by the name of James McGreedy began to preach and strange manifestations in the spirit began to take place in Logan, Kentucky. John, the Cane Ridge Revival broke out of this and the resulting revival launched camp meetings from as far away as western ohio reverend gardner spring reported that for the next 25 years not a single month passed without the news of a revival breaking out somewhere in 1824 charles finney began to preach and he would eventually lead 500,000 people to christ an unparalleled 100,000 were converted in Rochester, New York in 1831 alone, which caused another revival to begin to spread through 1,500 surrounding towns. And by 1850, the nation's population had exploded fourfold to 23 million people, but those who, who affiliated themselves with an evangelical church, that number increased tenfold from 7% of the population to 13%. In other words, they went from 350,000 church members to 3 million. 
1857, there was the Businessman's Revival. This took place in New York, where a North Dutch church hired a layman by the name of Jeremiah Lamphere to lead uh, a prayer meeting. And as he began to pray, God, what would you have to do? And as he walked the streets of New York, he realized how, how concerned the faces of the businessmen seemed to be. So he decided, I'll open the church at noon every day so businessmen can come and pray. Their first meeting was September the 23rd, and six men attended. The next week, there were 20. The next week, there were 40. And before you know it, the crowds became so large, they had to be open up other spaces. In fact, other churches around the town began to open up, and the noon prayer meeting began to host as many as one million people throughout the Northeast. And, and over a million people were converted and added to the roles of America's churches. In 1861, the Civil War revival broke out. We all know what, what the root of the Civil War was all about, the bitter dispute over slavery, which, which thrust this nation into the deadliest war that it had ever experienced. And by the end of that war... 620,000 Americans lay dead. That's one out of every 50 people that lived in the country, according to the 1860 census. At the start of the Civil War, everybody on both sides thought this was going to be brief. And the soldiers apparently decided to leave their Christianity and their morality at home. But when it became obvious the war was going to drag on and men began to become concerned about their souls, it says in 1862, this tide turned and revival first broke out among the Confederacy and it swept to the Union side and an estimated 300,000 soldiers on both sides of the battlefront were converted to Christ. In 1875, you had the urban revivals, and there was a young businessman by the name of Dwight L. Moody who was really key in seeing this, this revival uh, uh, jump to the forefront. <laughs> Moody was not an ordained minister. He's just a layman. But he began to conduct revivals throughout the British Isles where he spoke there to over 2,500,000 people. In 1875, he returned to the United States and began to hold revivals in America's largest cities. Hundreds of thousands of people were converted and millions were inspired by this greatest soul winner of his generation. Now, at this particular time... Christianity was beginning to have to deal with the onslaught of things like Darwinism and higher criticism. These theologies were gaining traction and Moody became the first evangelist to come under the attack of being accused of using religion as an opiate for the masses. By the time the end of the, of the century came and the 20th century launched, the mood of the country was beginning to change. Outside of the church, it became the era of radio, movies, the jazz age, age. World War I led to a moral letdown, and then came the Roaring Twenties. And when that era came to an abrupt end, we had the Great Depression in 1929. Throughout the country, there was very little interest in revival. Inside the church, you had a half-century-long battle raging between evangelicalism and, and, and critical theology, which had penetrated major denominations. And the effect was the 20th century revivals were very limited in scope, and they all lacked the, the impact on society that the earlier awakenings had experienced. But that's not to say that revival wasn't happening. In 1904 was the Welsh Revival, which started over in Wales. It spread back to the United States because there was a large contingency of Welsh-speaking Pennsylvanians. And as people began to come from Wales with the experience of what was taking place in the British Isles, they began to share it there. And by 1905, 
A lot of local revivals were beginning to blaze in places like Brooklyn, Michigan, Denver, Nebraska, North and South Carolina, Georgia, on the college campuses like Taylor University and Yale University and Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky. And one of the key figures who came out of this was a man named Billy Sunday, a professional baseball player who God got a hold of and began to use him to preach to more, get this, Billy Sunday preached to more than 100 million people. And under his evangelistic ministry, over 1 million people announced their conversion to Christ. The Azusa Street Revival followed this shortly in 1906, and it was led by an African-American man by the name of William J. Seymour. Seymour was known for fiery preaching and the fact that he was blind in one eye. He went out to Los Angeles to candidate for a pastoral job, and they were supposed to have two services. He preached the first service, and then they locked him out of the church before the second one. So he started a prayer meeting in a nearby home, and over time, the Spirit of God began to show up, and, and, and a massive prayer meeting began to launch out of this. An interracial prayer meeting, which was unheard of at that time. They acquired a dilapidated old Methodist church at 312 Azusa Street and held meetings every day consecutively for three years. And out of the Azusa Street Revival, the Pentecostal movement and the Charismatic movement was born. And then we had a post-World War II awakening. Following the Second World War, there were a couple of, of movements like the Latter Rain Revival, the Healing Revival, and large numbers of evangelicals were brought, were brought back to Christ through, through these efforts. But one, uh, not one, but a couple of individuals came out of this who had an intense impact on the spiritual climate of the country. One was a man named Bill Bright. Bill Bright is known as the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. And he was also the man who developed one of the greatest little evangelistic tools that has ever been created, the four spiritual laws. A simple little booklet that you could read through and lead somebody through a simple process of how you could come to Christ. But in 1949, another man erupted to the scene, and that man was Billy Graham. And Billy Graham came to the forefront with the great Los Angeles crusade that was sponsored by the Christian Businessman's Committee. During the years that Billy Graham preached, it's been estimated that 180 million people attended one or more of the 400 crusades that he held and millions more watched on television. In fact, uh, we lost Billy Graham last year. And I don't know if we'll ever see another one like him. But to give you an idea of how powerful his, and, and great his influence was, not just in the United States, but in other countries of we, as well, this is in Brazil. This is one outdoor rally. And that's Billy Graham standing on the left. God gave him a powerful platform to preach the gospel. A lot of college revivals began to burst out of this era. One was the Wheaton College Revival in 1950. And this was a revival based solely on prayer. And it, it gained national publicity. And it was responsible for sparking other college revivals across the country. There was the Jesus Movement of the 1960s. Now, we're beginning to get more into memory that you're going to start, you're going to, re, you, some of you, <laughs> me too, can recall some of these things. The Jesus movement challenged young people to turn from drugs and sex and radical politics and start taking the Bible at face value and finding Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. And it's, and it's not surprising that that revival really began to impact college campuses, most notably Will, uh, Asbury College in Kentucky. 
The Asbury Revival in 1970 broke out, and in one week, it had spread across the entire country. Part of the effect of this was in 1976. We elected the first man running for president who openly declared to be born again. And evangelism has continued to prosper from then. There were a lot of other revivals in, in the mid-1990s that, that, that weren't as large and did not cre catch, create as much traction. Uh, most of them were founded in the charismatic movement like the Toronto Blessing, the, the Brownsville Revival down in Florida. Um, but, but one in particular that seemed to take place among a lot of Baptist institutions was led by Henry Blackaby. You know, the man that wrote the, the study Experiencing God. And then the most recent that most of us men would remember is the Promise Keepers movement which started in, 1990, in, the, in the early 1990s. In 1991, 4,200 men, men descended on the University of Colorado under the encouragement of this man, Bill McCartney, who was a coach, a football coach at the University of Colorado, and he brought those men together to challenge their faith, and that revival reached its zenith on October 4, 1997, as over a million men gathered on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. By the way, we were about right there. You know, the only way I remember that, and here's how I remember where we were, this church. I remember we came into the mall. On, Jerry, remember? We came into the mall. We got off of the subway and came into the mall on this side of the church, came inside those trees, and walked about that far, and that was about as far as we could go. What a history. What a spiritual heritage the country has, yet here we find ourselves the skeletal remains of a past life bleaching in the sun. Scripture today comes from Ezekiel 37. If you have your Bibles turned there, we're going to start reading in verse 1. We'll have all of it. If it's a lengthy passage of Scripture, it's 14 verses. But I want you to follow along with me as we read. The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? Oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. And then he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, We have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore prophesy to them and say, 
This is what the Sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. Now, whether or not this was a vision or whether it was an actual event isn't the question. We know that Ezekiel experienced something unlike anything anyone had ever experienced before. I mean, here's the scenario. God allowed Ezekiel to see this vast valley covered with human bones. And these bones were very dry, which indicates that the men whose bones these belonged to had been dead for a long, long time. And all of the life, all of the vitality, all of the use had been bleached out in the sun. And God asks a stunning question. Can these bones live again? And Ezekiel said, Lord, you're the only one who has the answer to that question. So God gave Ezekiel a very strange and interesting task. Preach to these bones. Now, you want to talk about preaching to a dead audience. <laughs> but he did. And an incredible thing began to happen. The bones began to move and they began to arrange themselves into proper order. And then vital organs and muscle and ligaments and tendons and finally skin began to cover them and then life was breathed into them and they became alive once again. Wow! Beloved, it is time for life to be breathed back into the church of God. Amen. Amen. We did not get to where we are overnight. But dry bones are the result of a slow and, uh, I, I can say this, anesthetized death that takes the living and converts it into a corpse without them even realizing it. There's no evidence of life, no sign of any spirit. Spiritual drought has choked the life out of them, and now all they can do is lie there bleaching in the sun. Let's talk about the effects of spiritual drought. And thinking about the description I just gave you, have you ever known anybody that this has happened to them? Even more so. Could you possibly identify your own self among the bones? See, there was a time that you were strong. You were going from one mountaintop to another. But somewhere along the, along the journey, you just decided, I'm going to stay in the valley. And the valley became a place that was comfortable and became a place of compromise and finally a place of disillusionment and despair where your life perished. As a pastor, I can tell you something. It is painful to witness that from a distance. And we will try to encourage you. We will pray for you. We will support you. But if you allow the distress of the valley to overtake you, you are in danger of being lost. Beloved, listen. Don't stay in the valley. Keep moving forward. Keep progressing. Keep growing. And even though we desire this for every Christian we know, it still happens. And it is a sad realization when someone allows themselves to get caught up in a spiritual lacking and they die. Why do people let this happen? Why? Why? Especially knowing what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
Beloved, if, we will, if, if we ever take our eyes off of the temporary reward that sin offers, and if we lock it onto the everlasting satisfaction that comes from knowing Christ, the decision is easy. Jesus gives life. And the spiritual man within you that sin has left a scattering of dried out bones can be restored. It can be renewed. And it can be set free from sin's bondage. You can have real life in Jesus. Amen. Now, the physical drought comes, we know, when no rain falls over a long period of time. Well, spiritual drought comes when the rain of spiritual things stops. Things like time in the Word of God, communion with God in prayer, submitting yourselves to acts of service. Beloved, listen, if you're going to cross the valleys, you better prepare yourself. Otherwise, the valley will blister you with the heat of discouragement and setbacks and distractions and disillusionment, and you stay in the valley too long, and the drought will claim you. And the question is, is spiritual drought draining the life out of you this morning? Well, you can be reclaimed and restored. Amen. And here's how restoration starts. It starts with hearing the word of the Lord. Amen. Ezekiel said, then the Lord said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. Listen, to be revived, you've got to first hear the word. And the Word of God is powerful. It is mighty. And it is able to do far above that which we could comprehend. And it is by His Word that all things have been spoken into existence. It was by His Word that the earth was flooded for 40 days and nights. And it is by His Word that a man can experience life through Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter, thir uh, chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Jeremiah 23 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? God's Word is piercing. It is powerful, and it can draw us into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Beloved, listen, you can see, it's obvious, hearing the word of the, God, of the Lord will have an eternal impact on you. It will change you. Now, like I said, I, I've preached to some pretty dead audiences in my life, but I can't imagine trying to preach to a valley of nothing but bones. You talk about discouraging. But Ezekiel was obedient. He did what God asked him to do, and he started to preach. And as the word was declared, things began to happen. Going back to verse 7, he says, So I spoke this message, just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then, as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies. Listen, hearing the word of the Lord had a revolutionary effect on these bones. It set everything in right order. Every article, every piece was in its proper place. And they each became a new creation. Can you see a picture of revival here? Amen. I mean, you got these bones lying in the valley that were once alive, but now they're lost to death. Hey, just what is a backslider, beloved? He's a man who once had life in him, spiritual life, but for some reason that life has been forsaken, it's been lost, and all that's left for him are the bones of his despair. But hear the word of the Lord. Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And he also said, but these things are written 
so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in His name. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. And His word gives salvation and order and purpose and breath. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me. And breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Beloved, those who believe in Jesus are promised his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a sanctifier. He's an encouraging enabler. He's our comforter and our counselor. But in order for him to live in any, any man, that man has to be a vessel of honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, and ready for every good work. To be that vessel... You've got to die to yourself. You know, Paul called it crucifying the old man. In order to receive this breath, this power of the Spirit. I, mean, I want you to take note of something. Ezekiel proclaimed the word. The bones came together and they formed a complete flesh, bone, and body, and blood body. But there was no life in them. See, when a man responds to the gospel of Jesus Christ, he is set in order. There is a noising about. There is a shaking. There is a rearranging in his heart. He is a new man, a new man still operating in his own strength. And this recreation needs the power of the Holy Spirit. And I can testify to that. I was saved at the age of 17 right out of high school. And when I became a Christian, I worked hard to be successful in this new endeavor. And I did my dead level best to follow Christ. And after about a year, I came to realize I can't do this. And over the time as I read the Bible, I came to see even the disciples needed help. In fact, after the resurrection, as Jesus was about to ascend back into heaven, he told his followers, you guys need to wait in Jerusalem for the power that you're going to need to follow me. And then in Acts 2, we find these words. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven the sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Beloved, just as hearing the word will save and put a man's life in order, the same word will open you up to receive the Holy Spirit and his power. And this was evidenced by the fact that the disciples went from hiding in the upper room to rushing out into the street, boldly proclaiming the good news that Jesus was the Savior Messiah. I mean, look at Peter. Just 50 days earlier, on three separate occasions, he denied that he even knew who Jesus was. And now here he is, courageously, unashamedly, preaching to thousands the message. Jesus saves. What made the difference? He was now empowered by the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel's account, it says strength came from the breath. After proclaiming the breath of the Spirit to come on these new and reborn men, verse 10 says, they all came to life and stood on their feet. Nope, wrong one. They all, they all God, forget it. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Now they're ready for battle. Listen, before, beloved, when you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, then and only then are you ready to enter into spiritual warfare with the devil. The Holy Spirit will provide you the power and the strength to do things that otherwise you could not do. 
And there's no way in the world that I would stand up here Sunday after Sunday if I didn't believe that was true. You see, the odds of me being able to do something like this in what I've got are pretty slim. But beloved, all you have to do is read Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 and you'll see the truth revealed. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Listen, folks, this, that account in Ezekiel and this from Acts chapter 2, it reveals to us the pattern for spiritual revival. The gospel calls men to be new in Jesus Christ. And after that rebirth, be filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to do all things in His name. Amen. Amen. So what are the results of hearing the Word and receiving the Spirit? The results... A revival. Going back to what Ezekiel said, he said, I spoke the message as he commanded me. And breath came into their bodies, and they came to life and stood up on their feet. A great army. This valley that had been covered with dried, dusty bones of dead men was now transformed into a powerful army of living, breathing, vibrant warriors ready for battle. Once dead, but now revived and restored to new life. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He did not come, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Amen. You see, what is promised here is life. Abundant life here eternal life in heaven and it is promised to anyone who will believe and submit now let me simplify this if that's too complicated any man any woman any teenager any boy or girl who has never experienced the mercy and grace of God or for one who may have find themselves in a backslidden state listen you can be restored if you will let him restore you you can be saved and there is nothing greater in the universe. You have a revived, restored man. He has purpose in his life. Just as these bones responded to the Word, just as flesh covered these bones, as life entered into each being, the prophet compared them to a great army. The spiritual restoration that you experience enlists you into the ranks of the righteous. And as the army of the Lord... We stand for what is right. We resist the forces of evil. And we fight to rescue those who are perishing in the darkness of sin. The Spirit supplies us with the tools we need to wage this war. And those who are faithful in their duties will receive a reward. You know, someday the warrior is going to hear the Father say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Beloved, listen. Listen to me. Is your life like a valley of dry bones? Is there no vibrancy? Is there no purpose in your spiritual life? Then hear the word of the Lord. Jesus said, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come into him and he with me do you need to be saved you know here's the sad thing about church families We can come together like this for years on end and never realize somebody's lost. They're good people. They'll do anything for you if they can. But spiritually, they're bleaching in the sun. 
because there is no life. Do you need to be saved today? Do you need to hear the word of the Lord, have a reordering of your life, have everything be put into place, and, and be filled with the Spirit of God and be saved? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us in these few moments. God, help us because it is a difficult thing to have to admit sometimes that my life is not what it ought to be or that the life that I've been proclaiming, trying to portray has been a farce. And the truth be known, I'm nothing but a collection of dry dusty bones being bleached out by the, by the heat of the sun. Beloved, hear the word of the Lord. God has promised that anyone who comes to Him, He will in no wise turn away. There is no one who is beyond being saved. And if you will come to Christ today, He will do for you what He has promised to everyone who will accept Him and receive His finished work on the cross. Jesus died on the cross and shed His blood so that your sins could be forgiven and you could be given this new life. And He has sent His Holy Spirit to empower you to successfully live the Christian life. So it's really a choice that is in our hands. Will I choose life? Or will I choose the dustiness of drying out? Which will you choose? God help us today. I pray for the one who may be here today who needs to step out, say yes to Christ, and be saved today. Have their life put back in order. Have, have a new life and purpose breathed into them by your Spirit. God, have your way in Jesus' name. As we sing, I'm going to ask you to stand. The altars are here. If God is speaking to you today, if He's calling you to, to experience life and not the dryness of loss, will you come today and let Him renew you and restore you?